whenever I tell tell people this, they change their mind about me. <laughs> <laughs> so I can hear a lot of them being like, "Okay, that, that dude's pretty cool." <laughs> okay, <laughs> I thought he was a lame, but, but I nah, guess this now is he's cool. I guess this is important if people who know me today just think like. I don't know that I've always been like whatever a certain way. Well, I haven't. We all have a past, right? Um, do you want me to just say what the crime was or do you want me to say why I even fucking got in that boat and even did the crime? Say what the crime is and then say why you got into it. Okay. In 1995... Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we bring to you yet another great and vulnerable episode from us Tattoo Guardians here in the show. Uh, today's episode is uh, riddled with pain, with life, with adventure, uh, with ups and downs, and basically, we finally get into telling some of the Matt Clemmer story. Uh, brace yourself because uh, any skeletons that I may have in my closet are unearthed today. Uh, some of you that really respect me, it may challenge your even your viewer perception of me today. I got to be honest uh, with Josh and Hip probing me to get completely 100 and vulnerable. This episode is vulnerable, scary one for me to even reveal to you but in the name of us leaving this life and tattooing better than when we found it um and keeping it 100 and showing both feet uh i decided with the support and love of hip and mike to play full on out and be completely transparent and share it all with you and let the chips fall where they may um hope you get something good out of this and my ego hopes you still like me <laughs> after this. Anyways, thanks for tuning in. Brothers and sisters, we can't thank you enough for all your love, your support, and your faithfulness. It's been brought to my attention. If you really want to do something to bless us, to thank us, apparently simply hitting the like button on YouTube would be more impactful than what I ever knew, let alone subscribing to us on YouTube if you're not already. And then over on Spotify and Apple, please leave us a review. All of your listening and your comments to us mean the world to us. Um, and do us a favor and just hit like on YouTube and leave us reviews on Spotify and Apple. And we're going to continue to serve you with our whole heart. Thank you so much. How are you guys doing this evening? Good, brother. Awesome. Feeling good. Even better. So I think... Uh our listeners may be eager to hear this episode. I am, you know, I know I've talked to you a lot and for our listeners, we're going to be finding out who and what Matt Klimmer is and is becoming and has became and what trials and tribulations brought him to where he's at. Um, so it should be pretty interesting because I know in past episodes, there were things that like you touched on that we would get messages like, Ooh, what's that about? What's that about? What's that yeah. about? So today is going to be the day when you get to find out. <clears throat> or if you like have me on some sort of pedestal and just have great respect for me, you might want to just skip this episode. <laughs> <laughs> so I started blasting. <laughs> That's right. You know, they say never meet your heroes. This might be close. Maybe you just want to skip this one. <laughs> no. Oh, goodness. So fucking, where are you from, Matt? And I know it. Huh? Paint this picture for us. Well, uh, okay. <laughs> because because when I found out, it uh -huh. was uh, it was it was kind of shocking because you don't look like someone that would come from this place. Well, usually when you ask someone where they're from, sometimes it's a. Uh, I didn't know if you meant like literally, literally or yeah. metaphorically. 
Yeah, we're we're starting at the beginning. Okay. Well, actually, let's let, let's rewind even past that. Um, what's the feud between you and Todd about who's oldest and you stole his <laughs> birthright? It to womb, yeah, the womb. <laughs> starting at the there very there beginning. Is. In the womb, beginning, there it God, is. Yeah, <laughs> in the beginning, God created man and Todd. <laughs> <laughs> One of them will have two pee holes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I have an identical twin brother, for those of you who don't know. I'm the oldest of five boys. There are five Clemmer boys. Technically, I'm only the oldest by three minutes. Anytime we bring that up, Hip's asking us because my twin brother Todd will stop and tell everyone that I stole his birthright. And people start laughing, ha, ha, ha. And he's like, no, but seriously, he did. And, you know, I don't recall, but I've been told <laughs> that uh, Todd was on his way out. His head was already crowning. He was coming out. And apparently in the womb, I grabbed my twin brother by his ankles, pulled him back in the womb and spun him around. And I ended up coming out first. Since I spun him around, he had to come out feet first. So right there, he says Sam. I stole his birthright. And I guess rightfully so. He's got a point to top it off. Not only that. When we were born, even though we're identical twins, I weighed seven five and he weighed five seven. Mm. And so he also was in right when he had to come out when he since he had to come out feet first, there was extra pressure on his head. Somehow he had to undergo surgery immediately. We both were born with a thick head of hair. They had to shave his head and operate on it. So in all our babies' pictures, he's real skinny, bald and alert. And I'm like a fat Suma, just like sleeping, you know? And so he's pissed I stole his birthright. I took all the food in the womb. In our whole lives, I've always done it first. I've been a little bit taller, a little bit bigger. And he tells everyone he just f was able to forgive me for it all last summer, <laughs> you know? Wow. Yeah. But we were born in uh, 1995. <laughs> that's uh, quite a few decades off <laughs> yeah um no but you know we started out uh in what year were you born oh that don't matter <laughs> <laughs> i think it was short yeah. shortly after the kennedy assassination <laughs> <No>. <laughs> i think he told me that he got to see the first automobile drive by <laughs> Well, we all reached the point when we saw our first car, right? <laughs> oh, man. Um, you know what? My dad was undercover DEA agent my whole life, most of my life. He, not, he isn't today. Um, but I remember, you know, when we were kids, we grew up down on Delaware Avenue, downtown Dayton. Right now, it's a gated community. It's considered rough, the ghetto, right? Is that Five Oaks? It's right off Delaware and Salem Avenue. Okay. Yeah, probably close to Five Oaks. Yeah. Um, anyways, it, but it got so rough there, we ended up moving out of the city and moving to the farm. Well, my dad grew up on a farm, so he moved back in the farm that he grew up on. Well, guess what? So did my mom. And so when I was a kid, my parents got divorced when I was four. And so from the age four on, I was raised on two farms. And I think that's what you're referring to. I don't mm -hmm. look like a farm boy, mm -hmm. right? It's crazy because here in Dayton, Ohio, and you can attest to this, you can go 20 miles in any direction and be in totally a new world. Like you can be in the heart of the city, nightlife, skyscrapers, hop in a vehicle and go 20 minutes any direction and you're smack dab in the middle of farm. Go 20 minutes any direction, you're in the middle of the woods or you can go 20 minutes and be in the fucking ghetto like i feel like we've got the best of all worlds from great parks great hiking camping woods farm and major city you know dayton's city we're close to cincinnati and columbus so i feel like we got a nice mix of it all this is why i feel like people that grew up around here could have their hand in more than one culture mm -hmm. now most of my family especially on my mom's side was country Fishing, hunting, farming. Me and Todd had to feed 60 cows every morning before we got on the school bus, right? And that's um, your mom's farm? Yep. And I, well, and it was really grandma's. my mom's parents, grandma, grandma's, who, by the way, my grandma is literally, guys, my best friend. 
Uh, she was my best friend my whole life. She's since passed in recent years. I have given the gift of getting to s hold her hand and s me and Todd. I sat with her in the hospital for the last three weeks of her life every day, every night, even over to hospice. We were with her when she took her last breath. And not, we're not all given the gift of getting to say goodbye, right? But my grandma lived to be 95. Hmm. And was my fucking best friend all the way to the end. You know, when most folks get older, they change, right? Whether there's their brain, their heads, their perception, the way they communicate. That's why you'll see when people are talking to an 80 year old, 85 year old, let alone a 90, 95 year old, that you people change how they talk. But not my grandma. She had all her wits about her all the way to the very end. And even though her body was mm -hmm. 95, her brain, the same eyes that she had when she was 16 were the same eyes she was rocking at 95, you know, <clears throat> and that woman taught me love uh, so much. Whatever people uh, say are good attributes about me, I've got to credit, you know, a small handful of folks, but grandma's one of them, you know, um, but we can get uh, I can speak more on that later. But yep. So I grew up on a farm most of my life, but was so close to the hood, the ghetto, the city that I also had a nice mix of the city culture. And that's probably why, you know, and I'm an artist, so that's why, like, I don't look like a farm boy and it just wasn't in my blood. And, you know, and I grew up in rock and roll and hip hop and the whole deal. You know, Josh and I have talked about the eras of break dancing and Michael Jackson, all that, you know, um, and it was funny because on the school bus, I used to think I had it rough because there were kids getting off to go play like this new game called Nintendo and to eat fruit roll ups, which I think I've mentioned before. I thought I had it rough because I had chores waiting on me. But now I thank God for that upbringing, you know, um, literally just to know the value of work, growing our own food or raising our own livestock and just being having your hands in the dirt. You know. How how young were you when you started having to like do farm chores? Fuck. <clears throat> five? Yeah. Yeah. Five or six. By the time I was five and six, I was riding on the side of the tractor and combines. But yeah, I was able grandpa me and Todd was able to he made a makeshift ladder that we could climb up in the hay mountain. As soon as I was able to pick up a bale of hay and just drop it down. You were bailing. <laughs> That's the one thing I couldn't do is bale hay and I tried. I'm highly allergic. We found out the hard way in the first few seasons of Bale and Hay, man, my lungs would close up. It was like, I almost need to oh, go man. to the hospital, you know? And I remember feeling terrible because that was a man's man. That's Bale and Hay's fucking hard work. Most mm -hmm. people dread it, but it's like a fucking man's man's job. Like you think roofing's tough, <clears throat> try Bale and Hay. <clears throat> They're in the same, you know, upper echelon of fucking hard work. Mm -hmm. Um but even when you work hard like that, and so there's always work to do on the farm. I was too allergic to bale hay. And even as a young boy, felt like a punk bitch, almost, you know, almost like I wanted to be out there with the rest of the dudes, you know. And instead, I'm like <clears throat> snapping peas with grandma, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we did it all. I loved it all. And that uh, was a great foundation in my life or early on, you know. But it is funny because you could tell I was born like in my mom's side of the family because they were so country. They couldn't understand who and what the fuck I was like. You guys, anyone that's watching, you can tell I've got like fucking five foot long dreadlocks right now. Right. My point is, I've apparently I've never had normal hair like I've always like had weird hairdos. And so my family was always like, man, what the hell's wrong with that boy? Like you see what the <laughs> hell, he, what the fuck, you know? Um, and it took almost boy my, ain't right. yeah, that boy ain't right. There's something, man, he's fucking, uh, now my family loves and accepts me, but through my childhood, I think sometimes I was maybe embarrassing to them. You oh, know? I, I've, can re I for sure was embarrassing to my family. Okay. Same, same here. Yeah. Now, yeah. most of them will be like, oh, no, Matt, you weren't, but they lying. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's okay. Rewind back 30 years and, and see if this question was the same. <laughs> right. You, you said you were snapping peas with your grandma. Did your uh, grandparents um, can vegetables? We canned. 
We sold milk and butter and sweet corn from the driveway. I um, mean, we did it all. Like a straight up real farm. Straight cool. up. Could your, yeah. could your grandma make a mean vegetable soup? She could make a mean everything. Awesome. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, it, I took all that food for granted. Mm-hmm. Like now I actually clean my plate, but like if I could, man, if I could just go back and have one meal that my mm-hmm. grandma cooked and like sit down and eat it with her, that mm-hmm. would be amazing. Yeah. 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 Man, I'll tell you what, those of us that were blessed enough to have a good grandma that just loved us, there's something extra special about the prayers of a mama and definitely the prayers of a grandma. You know, in the scripture, it talks about a gift of intercessors. And an intercessor is someone that God will use their authority, the authority he gave us all, but he'll use someone else's authority, the one that's willing and aware as a vessel for prayer to flow through them on the behalf of someone else's life. And my grandma and mama were like lifetime intercessors for me and my brothers, like praying, placing hedges of protection around us and stuff because we got into some wild, wild, crazy shit. And I've lost count how many times I could have or should have died. And sometimes it made me wonder, I can't believe I lived through this. I can't believe I didn't die tonight. And I can't help but wonder if it was grandmama's prayers over me that just fucking kept me in the game another day. Mm. You know, who knows? Mm. But it'll be fun to find out one day. It's like, yep, here's your life, Matt. And you should have died 4,227 right. times. <laughs> but every time like, before you did, your grandma knew it in the spirit and she blocked it for you, you right. know? It'd just be fun to find out. <clears throat> I think that's awesome that you guys were so close. I'm lucky yeah. enough that I have, I had incredible grandparents. My grandmother's alive. She's 96 and she does not know who I am at this point, mm-hmm. but she was alert and aware till pretty recently. Yeah. I had a, my grandfather was just incredible. So those of you that have what Matt's talking about, like, yeah. Count yourself lucky. Mm-hmm. A good grandparent. I look forward to the day when I can be an awesome grandfather. Yeah. When it's time. Yeah. Hell yeah. I'm going to rock. My God. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, I said for years, guys, because people that get to know me realize that I walk in love. You know, I was just in Miami this past weekend. Uh, you know, I got called to a whole different world uh, with some entrepreneur brothers of mine. One of my coaches who was on this show, Andrew Crozy. Um, was his birthday and he's got his inner circle of like what he calls his soul uh, tribe and I'm on that list and I was one of four guys that he had fly into Miami to celebrate and I had no idea what we were in for Uh, but we ended up going to a big music festival called Three Points where it's just like multiple stages of like DJs and shit so it was like an all it was basically a two-day rave, you know, and I had no idea what I was in for. And you missed you know? it, Josh. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you missed it, man. Glow sticks Damn and all. It. And there's funny pictures because most of the people I was around and rolling with were hardly wearing clothes. Like any of the photos, it's me fully dressed with a bunch of people <laughs> like half naked, you know. But anyways, those guys all called me. They're like the light, their lighthouse, like just my being, you know. And they were amazed how, like, even complete strangers. Now, maybe someone's, like, really losing their mind on some LSD or rolling hard or uh, tripping, on, you know, out on Molly. But people in the crowd would see me and flock to me and come and just need help. And there would be complete strangers, dudes and chicks that would come to me. I'd hold them, and I'd just discern how what they needed, and they'd just start crying you know, until they got filled up and recharged and went back out. And all my dudes was like, damn, Clemens, the motherfucking lighthouse for everybody. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and the only reason why I bring that up is because any people that get to know me or experience, you know, a lot of people that really know me say, man, Clemmer walks in love. Right. And for years I used to say, well, my grandmama taught me unconditional love. And I would always say that. My grandma and mama taught me unconditional love. But the more I said that, I realized, what does that even mean? Is there any other kind of love? Like, isn't all real love unconditional, you know? Um, And so it just made, but whatever, to the degree of love that I know and been able to walk in and receive and partake and share like our breath, this vulnerable thing called life, man, 
is not only the greatest gift, I believe is the greatest power, um, but it's been the greatest thing in my life to not only save my life, but continue me on the journey of healing, of growth, of breakthrough, and choosing never to be the victim. This is why I come up with the term creative overcomers, because love trumps all. And grandma's got a big reason why I feel like I even know what that is, because mm. I was taught it <clears throat> by showing it. Example. Can I give you guys an example? Yeah. Yes, please. <clears throat> All right. Fuck, man. This shit's vulnerable. <laughs> did you guys struggle when you guys were telling your stories? Or was it just I like, did, hey, I did, yeah. Did you? No, I did for sure. Yeah. Okay. Because I've already, you know how many thought times I've thought we need to stop and start over? Like, <laughs> this sucks. Redo. Well, oh, man. Uh, Right. I fucking ours. Mine was the very first fucking episode. So the yeah, very I was first nervous one. the whole time. And I remember when we were done, you wanted to do over, and then you decided to let go right. and let it run. Yeah. My God. Anyways, in the name of being vulnerable, I'm taking a page out of your book and admitting in the moment that I'm uncomfortable. Good. Right? You're good at doing that. Yeah. Is that you're doing. You're doing great, man. Okay. Good. <laughs> so, guys. Um, Fast forward a little bit, and we grew up, and we became wild. I became a wild child, child like a lot of us do. Like Hip became one, and when he was a young boy too. It don't matter. You can have loving parents or whatever. That doesn't mean that you might not turn out to be wild as hell, right? right? And I was. Didn't mean I didn't know love. And I think you know we've talked about this, like because I've done every drug out there to do except for the one that got you, which was heroin. And you know what? Maybe that's the one that would have got me and maybe any opportunity I was just new, like mm, whatever. My internal voice was like, mm, not nah, hold off on that one. That might have been the one because it's blown your mind how many seasons I've been through in my life where I did hardcore drugs for a duration of time and then was able to just set it down and walk away. And I think it's because most times I wasn't in escape mode from my life as much as an artist wanting to go on an Alice in Wonderland type of adventure. Yeah, you, you told me a story of, of uh, your, your younger brother, uh, Bart, ha had like a trap house allegedly back in the day. Mm -hmm. And like there were dudes like smoking crack and you were hanging out with the crackheads like smoking crack with them for the fact to like experience. Well, you know? allegedly Bart had six dope spots in the city with this homie. Bart's my little brother, one of the five. Um they this was back in fucking TRU days where he was like TRU. Uh, those of you remember some old hip hop and you know you might know what I mean when I say TRU. But him and his all his cats got it tattooed on him. Uh, Bart would roll around with fucking sawed off shotguns and triple beams and pounds of weight in his trunk and an ashtray wow. full of blunts and just bumping his shit, not giving a fuck. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Ready to die. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <clears throat> and at the time, all of Bart's friends were black, you know, and now I grew up having all kinds of friends. But at this season of life, Bart was like that crazy white boy that was accepted in the, over the west side of Dayton where it's only black folks. And, you know, I don't know if you ever you probably have gone, you know, to the, the west side where it's only black folks. But there's always usually just one white dude in there that's mm. not only accepted, but respected by all. And he's usually the craziest one of the bunch. Well, that was my brother, Bart. They all loved Bart and, and they knew Bart, you know, and we was down to die, meaning like we were so down for one another. There was an old uh, one hit wonder by the Fifth War Boys and their song was called Down to Die. It was my first tattoo. I got it when I was 15. I designed it myself in <laughs> old English right here on my arm. And it says <laughs> down Roman numeral two <laughs> die. <laughs> yeah, because we was hard as fuck, boy. <laughs> Say some, <laughs> right? <laughs> you call somebody. That's right, man. The fuck? <laughs> but anyways... And, you know, people that know who I am today, I'm such a lover. That's just hilarious. Like, you've got a tattoo that says down to die. I'm like, you fucking Yeah, it's, really, it's interesting to, to watch it peek out of you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I only know you. I only know you from really, you know, the road and, and the podcast. Yeah. So this is really fascinating to me. Okay, good. I didn't, I, I didn't know about that tattoo at all. Yeah, right. It was my first one. I got it in a trailer. 
There was a dude, and I remember, man, we were 15. It was me and nine of my boys. We are all going to get down to die, right? That was like the club. And we found this dude that was just, he was, well, nowadays we'd call him a scratcher in a fucking mobile home trailer. And we were so amazed with this dude, Josh, because when we walked in and we were intimidated as fuck, these were older guys. He had a tattoo machine, but he also sold weed. Not only did he sell weed, he grew it indoors in this trailer. It was him, his couch, his tattoo set up. The rest of the floor was all weed plants and grow lights and what made it even cooler is this dude had a pet iguana that roamed free and manicured his plants for him <laughs> and the iguana would go up and like trim and eat the leaves and leave the buds and we just thought hey right. this dude was the fucking shit <laughs> you know what i'm saying <laughs> well me and my other buddy went first and got down to die all the other dudes saw the looks on our faces and they all bowed out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, no. Um, also, again, my dad was a cop. And at the time I lived with him and I went up to him again. I'm 15. I was like, hey, dad, do you, you care if I get a tattoo? And the answer was, fuck, no. But dad knew me. He had to come hard with me because he knew I don't really ask permission for shit. I'm feeling you out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. And so he came extra hard and he was like, man. He was like, no, you can't get a tattoo. And if you do, you cannot live here. So, again, I was feeling him out. So, I was like, what that tell guys like me and you, Hip? Yeah, I'm better hide this. Mom. <laughs> better hide this motherfucker. I'm going to get it. I just better hide it, right? right. Get it right here on your forearm. <laughs> Isn't the easiest place to hide. Now, when it was healing and I could still feel it, it was a good reminder. I can hide it. Well, you know, I'd go to mom's on the weekends. Well, I was at my mom's on the weekends. It was healed and it was out flying. Well, my dad just room, randomly, I was out mowing grass. My dad was on his motorcycle with all his buddies and pull up on me. And I'm standing there, you know, just talking to him. And then he sees it. And I'm like, fuck. And he kept his word and immediately kicked my ass out. I was 15. You know what I'm saying? Well, I could stay at mom's, you know, and I did for like so a year. So you didn't hide it for very long. Well, I was at my mom's house, so I wasn't hiding it there. I didn't know he was going to roll him. up on a motorcycle out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? He right. don't love, you know, he don't like my mom. He don't <laughs> come over to visit, you know. <laughs> but really, since I was mowing the lawn, he caught me out at the end at the road. And I'm at the road, and here he comes on the motorcycle. So since he sees me, he stops, and I got fucking in trouble. Whatever. Back to my, you know, and growing up, I was, again, the artist in me. I was the partier, you know. But it was funny because I was also such a lover. And I was already a young entrepreneur, a young leader, a young, like, trying to create. I all have always been about inclusion, no matter what I was up to. Parties, drugs, you name it. I was always the guy that wanted everyone to be happy. You know, you, you've heard stories like when I'd buy drugs, I'd buy enough for me and the whole fucking party. If I'm going to a party, I'd bring enough for me and the whole party. I always hated it when people, and I know, get it, and everyone had much money when people would just buy like a teener and like you'd be at a party, but then there'd be another room of just certain select few going in there like doing blow and then coming out with there. And then it always created division and weirdness and the who's who. And are you cool enough to go back and do lines or not? And I always was like, fuck all that. If I'm in the, pl I, so I've always been about abundance. So when I'd show up to one of those deals, I'd literally be like, well, who's the plug? I, I'm going to buy enough for the rest of the people out here that are being left out. And so I've always had that heart for others, even if we're fucking, uh, you know, partying but what anyways i'm getting sidetracked so dad kicked me out uh, by the time i was 17 i decided i'm a man now and i dropped out of high school um i had mom sign emancipation papers and so you know after my junior year man i dropped out of high school and decided to start moving weight <clears throat> i also toured the grateful dead because i had a lot of connects of old school hippies you know out at the dead shows and i'd go to these dead shows which were like going back in time now even though i got dreadlocks i'd never have been a hippie oh, here we go into jam music <laughs> i've never been into like <clears throat> but i respect the grateful dead uh, uh, for what they achieved and especially what they did no other band ever did by basically fucking 
doing it themselves, right? So if I threw you <laughs> a hacky the- sack right now, you couldn't stall it? <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> but I will tell you, the shows in the scene of the dead scene, I don't care if you like their music or not, the scene just going is so much fun. Mm. And it's like going back in time. And I'm talking like, you're, you're, you could, when the sun goes down and look in the hills, you could maybe count a thousand campfires that look like candle lights in the hills. And the cool thing about it is you can walk to any of those campfires or all of them and be welcomed as if you were family, mm-hmm. you know? So the scene was real dope. So I'd go and cause again, I love people and we go and have fun, but I had some good connects for, you know, it. I'm dropped out of high school, 17, about to be 18 and living in Brookville by myself. Well, me and a roommate got my own house and I'm moving truckloads of weight into the city. And so at this point, I thought, I'm doing all right. I'm not doing shit that I can go home and be like, Mom and Dad, I told you I'd make it. Ain't you proud? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, <clears throat> and, and so anyway, for most folks, they considered that wild. Now, again, I was always a lover. But when you start operating on a high level... Even though I was moving weight, you know, me and I said I'm a lover, meaning like I wasn't into gang banging and shit like that. Right. But I wasn't far from it. And like my brother Bart and his whole squad, they had to live in that. And so it will it gang banging with them came with the territory. With me, it did. I'd go to the Grateful Dead show, you know, schedule a load. But some of the guys I would disperse, you know, and I really dealt with four men in the city. And they would disperse everything. I also was basically just moving weed. Now, there was a time when LSD was like a a thing, too, and people loved it, you know. And that's a drug that uh, I don't believe is right for everybody. And you've got to be strong enough in your soul, your mind, your spirit to even enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And back in the 90s when we all had beepers and pagers, my pager would go off all the time because... I would be the guy that they would call if anyone was losing their mind on LSD. They'd page me to come to the party and save them. <clears throat> and that would be like a weekly thing. Someone's losing their mind and they need clemmer. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes I was tripping balls too. And so I had to be strong enough not to let you tweaking suck me into your fucking nightmare. But for me to be strong enough to pull you out of yours and bring you to the light. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but that was, again, just adventurous what was todd what was he doing at this time so todd was always real straight laced and that's what's funny because in high school because i was the outgoing one and i was like you know i was president uh school pre- class president you know um all of that and in in jvs or the um ctc the joint vocational schools you know once you're a sophomore they the counselor is like, are you going to college or you want to go into a trade? If right. so, you go to the high school that you can already take plumbing for two years and get out and have job placement. And I took commercial art, you know what I'm saying? Which was another just big party, you know what I'm saying? Um, but Todd was real straight laced, but people thought I was the straight laced one. And I've got good grades. I'm president of the class. And Todd was so reserved. Everyone thought and called him a burnout. Like they thought he was the stoner kid. But really, I was. And I always did things years before Todd, but I'd say maybe by our freshman year in high school, because I think I was smoking weeds from like sixth grade on and always invited Todd. He's my twin brother. We had different friends hung out on Fridays. I'd go with mine. He'd go with his. But I always wanted Todd to try whatever I was into. And for years, finally, by the time we were freshmen, I got him to try weed. Before that, I think in eighth grade, he asked me to teach him and his buddies how to properly inhale a Marlboro. You know, and that was a big deal, man. Get like some quarters and go to the machines at Casano's and look when no one's looking and grab yourself a pack of Marlboros and then we'll go, you know, the football game and smoke them. <laughs> you, know the bleachers, yeah. you know, <laughs> um, but by the time we were freshmen, you know, uh, is when I taught Todd how to and his friends how to smoke weed. And that became like our daily regiment after school was even if we like saved our lunch money and had, took our $5 for lunch and bought a, a, a joint with it and save it till we got home. And I had an art studio in my garage and every day after school, we'd come home and I'd roll up a pinner and Todd and I would hit it and be great for the night. And that was like our ritual. But the 
thing is by freshman, sophomore years, when I started tripping on acid and loved it and wanted Todd to try that, of course, he was like, hell no. So guys, I'm about to tell you a quick story of one of the meanest things I've ever done, but didn't realize it was a mean thing at the time. I wanted Todd to try LSD so bad. Oh, God. That one day. <laughs> going, oh, shit. So one day after school. Now, it's mind, like my worst nightmare. <laughs> I'm saying, dude, now one day after school, man, I had been tripping. Someone convinced me to go ahead and dose during school. And so I'd been tripping all day in school and I started a portrait of myself. And for whatever reason, I did myself in blue. By the way, I also had nine eyeballs popping out of my head and I was doing it with 3D glasses on, you know, and I was making these eyeballs come out at me. And so I'm tripping with 3D glasses on. And I took that uh, piece home and set it up in my garage after school. So I'm like tripping and working on my portrait i was using color pencils and oil pastels and it was like fun and you know when you're tripping you can fall into a wormhole at time you don't know if it's been 10 hours or 10 minutes sometimes right? right well todd comes home from school but before we hit our normal daily joint he decides he needs to, wants to go in and take a nap on the couch first and ask me if i'd save it for him yeah bro I'll wait till you get up cool and i don't know why i'm sitting there painting my portrait it's like now's my chance <laughs> and I fucking went in the house and took a dose of LSD and I dosed my brother while he was napping and didn't say shit. I just dosed him and then went back out to the garage, you know, <laughs> and like 10 minutes later, he woke up and, and came out to smoke the joint with me. Now I know it only been 10 minutes. I knew that acid hadn't kicked in him yet and I haven't said nothing, but I'm in my head just prepared thinking it's going to be a normal night. He's going to smoke this, hang out. Once it kicks in, I'm going to be the brother I've always been to usher him into this new realm and nurture him and make sure he really has a good time, right? So we smoke this joint and the second we're done, all of a sudden my mom pulls down the lane. He's like, well, Okay, got to go. I'll see you. I'm like, huh? I was like, w where are you going? He's like, oh, mom's coming to pick me up. Take me down to Price Brothers to get fitted for my tux for prom and then out to Spaghetti Warehouse. I'm like, oh, for God. real? And he's <laughs> like, yeah. I'm like, uh... Okay, dude, have fun. <laughs> and he had just gotten his temps. He's like 16. So mom hops out of the driver's seat and gets in the passenger seat. You know, when you just get your temps, you want to drive, hop over, mom. And I'm like sitting there and I just can't say anything. I'm just like, bye. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> didn't say shit you know so i'm like huh oh well and i just go back to doing my portrait fall on a wormhole well god knows how much time it passed but he comes rolling back down the lane but when he comes back he's not driving <laughs> and he gets out and he comes in and he's just looking at me and his eyes were huge and he's like man and he just knew it first he was thinking what was in that joint but then it hit him so hard he's like dude what did you do to me? he's like i'm tripping aren't i i'm like yeah. <laughs> he's like, I knew when they put that tux on me and put me in front of the mirror, he's like, man, I couldn't even look at myself. And he was like pulling on his tux. They're like, it looks really good. And he's like pulling on it. Like, really? You know, <laughs> and mom took him to Getty Warehouse. He said he couldn't even eat, you know, um, which again, that's why I said that's probably one of the meanest things I've ever done. But at the time, didn't know it. You know, I thought I was doing something cool. Um, and he made it through uh, and him and I had a blast the rest of the night when he came home and hit those uncontrollable laughs. Yeah. You know, when sometimes when you're tripping, you'll start laughing. You For can't nothing. stop. Your mm -hmm. face is hurting, you know. And so he's on one side of the garage. I was and that happened and it was fun, but then it wouldn't stop. And to where <laughs> both of us like decided to break it, we'd have to quit looking at each other because like we were laughing and it was felt like a physical force locked our heads together it was like a weird twin thing and i felt like i couldn't turn my head he couldn't turn his and we're looking at each other we're stuck but we're like laughing but it's not really funny you know what i'm saying and all of a sudden and boom we both push real hard to break our head away and we finally did and i was so scared to look back up at him because we had just gotten unlocked so i remember we were talking to each other without looking at each other for a while and here's some crazy twin trip and shit because at that moment all of a sudden i felt something grab my head and grabbed his at the same time and it locked our heads back together we were locked in 
And then all of a sudden, his head completely came off, and so did mine, and they went around and swapped. And his head floated over on my shoulders, and my head floated on his shoulders, and then relocked. And now I'm looking at me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and that really fucking wigged us wow. out for a minute, and we immediately tried so hard to break away and we were locked and finally we broke away and we were both grabbing our head like trying to feel like did i get my own head back or i'm still am i still you you know what i'm saying but uh so that's what i mean by adventures <laughs> you know what You're I'm right. um and so that was the beginning of many years of living a lifestyle like that even todd became at one point like big into party and big into LSD and you know, you can build a tolerance. And again, the connects I had the dead shows. Um, and hopefully I can't get in trouble for any of this now, <laughs> you know, but, uh, <clears throat> we would get vials of liquid mm -hmm. and just drop a drop on a sugar cube. That'd be a nice dose. And one night, Todd and I decided to get so crazy and they came in vials of a hundred and we took a hundred, a vial of a hundred, dumped the whole thing in a Gatorade, shook it up. Me and Todd split it. You know what I'm saying? Right. And we were like tripped for days, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but that's what I mean by like big adventurous type hearts. But there were some times where it was like, whoa, hopefully we come back. You know right. what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and we did. Uh, but yeah, I'll pause right there in case we want to like turn the chapter. No, no. I'm you know, <laughs> A, a lot of people don't know this about me, but acid was my drug of choice. Was it? And uh, yeah. absolutely. Mm. So uh, I know a little bit about like when you when you smoke marijuana and drop acid, yeah. like that's pretty that's pretty powerful. Yeah, it sneaks up on you. Yeah. So I can't imagine what Todd went through, like waking up and not knowing. You know what I mean? It was crazy enough to know. So wow. No shit, that's man. Crazy. And that's something you once you would never do to someone really that you cared about. Right. I just, it's like 13 hours too. It's oh, like totally. There's no know, turning to it that. off. It's like yeah, being I stuck. The acid, like the blotter acid. Yeah, that's right. You know, a little piece of paper. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. And that's like being stuck on a roller coaster. You just got to wait till the ride ends. Yeah. You had a bad trip. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I used to write myself a little notes and be like, everything is okay. Mm -hmm. You took acid. You're fine. <laughs> yeah. I have to like remind myself you know mm -hmm. mm -hmm. crazy yeah dude and i was that guy for so many people somehow i guess spiritually <coughs> i knew like those notes you were talking about josh were in my dna mm -hmm. for me and everyone uh and that's i think the funny thing that i noticed because that was fucking maybe 30 years ago <clears throat> you know and just this weekend i was revisited that type of atmosphere and was surrounded by people. The difference is I'm much older, but I was partying with a lot of 20 year olds and some 30 year olds. Um, and they were all wigging and I became that guy again without even having to say it in the spirit. They just knew it. I need help. And there you'd see people scour. There's thousands of people. <laughs> And they would find me, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Which is just interesting. Um, and I think it was even brought to my attention by the, those observing because I'm used to that. That's the way it's always been. And you don't realize till you have an external measuring stick to be like, hey, that's not normal, Matt. I'm like, oh, it's not, you know, <clears throat> but beautiful, you know, absolutely beautiful. But, okay, let's change the... the uh, or go back to another page because unless you were about to ask me something. Well, I just, you know, like for people that are listening to this, um, because when I first met you, I even asked you, you know, like, you know, what kind of drugs did you do? Cause it was always like my, um, introduction to get to know someone and see where their head was at to like, I don't know. I guess it was like my way of like knowing if someone's cool or, or not by mm. the level of hard drugs they did. And you would yeah. tell me things like, you know, you go to parties and you'd buy a fucking half ounce of fucking Coke for everyone else that wasn't able to be in the cool kids club and right. the fucking little sister's bedroom. That's right. Um, and I just remember thinking like, man, where the fuck were you at when I was, uh, you know, I'd have been your best friend, I, boy. I know, man. <laughs> and I would have fucking got you every day. Too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would have, you know, and, and you know, you, you talking about like, you know, 
uh, fucking eating some Xanaxes and being in a party and walking around just passing out money to everybody and fucking like. And my one dude, he was sober because he knows my heart, right? And it's right. I went to, because I was made my last stop uh, handling all business before it's time to go party. Because I was the type, once I started partying, it, I'm done doing business, right? right? So I made my last stop, but I went to go meet my dealer to pick up, I think, a quarter pound. You know, just need it for the party, by the way. Right. Now, there's no party in the history of ever that I went to and we actually smoked a whole quarter pound. But you know me, I always like coming prepared, mm -hmm. you know. And to this day, if we go on a two-day trip, I'm going to pack a suitcase of maybe 20 outfits, A, I'm prepared, B, we'll see what we get into, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm always over-prepared financially. You know, there's a weird thing with me to this day. You won't catch me nowhere. Listeners, if you're looking for a good lick to hit, you catch me on the street. I usually <laughs> always got two grand cash on me. <laughs> always, though. But a lot of times, that's in case for two reasons. One, emergency, and if my card's not working, you know, or got dinged for fraud. Now I can't check my own hotel room, which has happened. So I always have two or three gang cash, right. but it's usually if I'm called to bless somebody, you know, but anyways, on this particular night, I picked up the QP and this, my, my connect or whatever, the dope man kept trying to tell me about these purple footballs. Like, man, you should just try them. Like he always asked me like, man, your clients would probably like these. I didn't know what they were. You know, they were Xanaxes and they was calling them purple footballs and I didn't, I wasn't hip to them. Well, on this particular day, I had some of my dudes in my car and he held up a ball. He's like, man, I still got them purple footballs. And he just threw them at me. He's like, you can have those. Try them. Try them with your clients. I guarantee they'll love it. Then holler at me. Right. And I'm like, and then my dudes in the car was like, fuck yeah. And I'm like, you guys know what these are? They're like, yeah. I'm like, could you help me sell them? They're like, yeah, let's go. You know, so we go to this party. And once they open up, they start selling. Well, they sell footballs to everyone at the party and everyone eats them. And just because everyone was so stoked about it, I remember that moment pouring like 12 out in my hand <laughs> and downing them. I downed Fuck. like 12 and slammed like a bush light. I was like, wonder what these do, you know? <laughs> and I don't remember anything. Fuck at, nah. I remember about the next 10 minutes. And then I don't remember anything. And when I finally passed out, supposedly I slept for two days. I didn't wake up the next day and slept all through the next day. And I was at my buddy's house. His mom was a nurse monitoring me. Right. But when I woke up, I had nothing. I didn't have any money on me. I didn't have that quarter pound. I didn't, I went, I didn't have nothing. And I was in no memory of what happened. Well, guess what? No one else remembered shit because everyone was zaned out. But I finally got a hold of one of my buddies. He was the only one that didn't eat any. And when I called him, again, this is two days later, and he was pissed at me. <laughs> you know, he was mad at me. I was like, oh, God. Now, I always knew I'm not the type. No matter how fucked up I get, I don't become mean or nothing. So I'm thinking, what on earth could I have actually done to make you mad at me? And he's like, Clemmer, you're so, so fucking stupid. I tried to save you, man, but you literally was trying to bless everyone. And you gave everything you had away. <laughs> and he was like mad at me. And he'd go behind me because I was just handing out drugs, weed, money. And just giving all my money away and he'd be like, he doesn't, he's a lover, but he don't know what he's doing. And he'd go behind me and take it all back, knowing that if I was in my right mind, I probably wouldn't give it all away. And he was trying to help me and I would catch him and almost bitch him out and be like, no, I just gave that to her. You fucking give it back. You know, and he was like <laughs> so mad at me that I wouldn't let him save me from over giving. Right. Well, immediately I wiped my brow like, okay, I guess that's a, if you're going to be mad at me, I, I that's a good reason right. versus me doing something stupid, you know. Right. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, I don't know where we were going with that. Other well, I just, it, because we were just so polar opposite, like you would be the guy that, you know, came to help people when they were wigging out. And I would be the dude to try to cause them to wig out. And I myself like to trip out. So you'd like to fuck with them or in, induce someone wigging while I'm trying to save them. Yeah, totally. Right. Like, and like, so that's the only part of you and I probably wouldn't. Have, I don't know. I, I may have just not have allowed you to do that in my presence. Well, <laughs> and, and now, now, like, it wasn't like. Well, I mean, I guess it was a little bit of like. It, when I'm thinking about doing it, it's more like a, a a little kid playing a prank, 
Because gotcha. right. ultimately, yeah, there's ends. not malicious intent. It's your way of rassing. Right. You know, I'd get fun. behind the wheel of a car and we'd drive and chase tornadoes and like do fucking wild ass shit. Oh, yeah. Um, but when people would big out, I just would think it would be funny and right. like, you know. And I think I'm just so sensitive because I could see, yeah, I could see surface level how it'd be funny there over there wig. And a lot of people, I think that's why I'd be the one page because I could go in. And literally in the spirit realm, meet someone in the spirit and literally pull them out of that deal, you know, all the fucking time. Uh, and I truly cared because I could see someone like if they were battling in a nightmare and they didn't have sticky notes like Josh had to let them know you're all right. This ride will end. I was that. And I think I still am that for people in the even in the sober world. You know, when we were kids. <clears throat> Like most kids, we all get asked, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up, right? And, you know, my brother's like, you know, Heather said like firefighter, a cop, a lawyer, an actor, professional athlete. You know, a lot of boys have similar like, you know, Air Force, whatever, <clears throat> Army man, football player. My answer was always the same. At around five or six, I told everyone I wanted to be Moses to help lead people out of bondage. <laughs> you know? In the crate, and I don't know why I'd that say was a lot for a five year old. Yeah, and I don't know why that right. was my answer, but that was my answer my whole childhood that I felt like I was called to be like Moses to help lead people out of bondage. Well, God didn't give me a staff, but He gave me a microphone and a tattoo machine, right? Like, um, and the, the crazy thing is from that day till now, that answer remains the same. Now, the manifestation iterations of it, what it looks like has changed over the years. But I feel like I've had the honor of being called to help lead people out of bondage. Uh, I feel like I've been given the gift to be a healer in more ways than one. And that's why part of my story wrecks the religious people's minds of how many uh, this vessel right here has been used for healing miracles, miraculous shit. And it would blow religious people's minds. Cause it's not like I was like doing all the things like <clears throat> that supposedly you're supposed to do or be for God to like fucking flow through. Yeah. That's right. why just my own life and my own story will annihilate religion, uh -huh. you know, but it also points to the love of the father is not contingent upon who you are being right uh and again between that just being in my dna and having pillars in my life like my grandma a rock to show me and cultivate love on levels of power and so leading back to my grandma example that i was going to tell you guys before i got nervous <clears throat> This one story right here, if you guys are even still fucking listening, <laughs> this one story right here changed the trajectory of my life. Now, most things is a combination of little things and events that mold us, but we can sometimes point back to certain events that you know, boom, impartation happened, transformation happened, a seed was planted, right? And this was one of the major ones in my life. <clears throat> it's the first time I ever got arrested. And I did three days in jail. Now, first off, usually if a dude in Dayton gets arrested and does three days in jail, he may make the paper. You know, it's in a certain column, right? You can look it up, look at people's mug shots. Right. But if you were the son of one of the head dudes on the police force, my dad also ran for mayor of Dayton. So if you're that dude's son and get arrested, that shit's front page. Right. Hey, the mayor's son, you know. <clears throat> Even though my dad didn't become mayor, but basically he was famous enough, you know. Uh, and so I knew, fuck, man, I fucked up. I was showered in condemnation. I knew that my dad was pissed. He'd already kicked me out. Now I've shamed the family name. Now it's in the newspapers. It's going to make him look bad. His firstborn's a hell yeah, whatever, right? So my mom came, picked me up, went and bailed me out. No words were spoken. I hop in the shotgun. She's driving. Again, I'm 
covered in condemnation and shame, ready for the lectures, for the speeches, ready for the uh, to get in trouble, ready to get kicked out, ready to be told you, I can't all the shit. Right. <clears throat> I'm ready and got my guard up. Now, mind you guys, <clears throat> just because I got in trouble, just because I did jail time, just because I got caught. None of that changed my heart. It didn't make me think, oh, I got to straighten up. I shouldn't do this shit no more. It just made me think I got to be smarter so I don't get caught like this again. Mm -hmm. Right. It didn't change my heart, just my mind, how I'm going to do it differently. <clears throat> I didn't know where mama was taking me. <coughs> Sorry. Until she kept driving and started making turns down country roads. And then I realized she's taking me to the farm out to grandma's. And grandma's my best friend and my safe place. But I was so covered in shame. I didn't want to see nobody, you know. But grandma's the person I can't even hide from. But she's also the person that loves me more than anyone. Again, folks, I was prepared for the lectures, the condemnation, all of that. But what was about to take place was the one thing I was not prepared for. Folks, when my mom turned it down the lane and we're pulling in the gravel lane of the farm and I look up and there I see not only my grandma standing on the front porch of the farm, but standing behind her like 48 family members, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, like the whole fucking family. They stood there in reverence to receive me. Do you remember those old first renditions of printers when you'd print off like it'd be perforated edges and shit? Anyways, my grandma made her own banner and a big welcome home sign. She was standing there, folks. She had baked a cake <laughs> like and when we rolled in, I looked up and I couldn't believe it was grandma with a welcome home sign, the cake and the whole family there to receive me. And treat me as if I was like some war hero that has come home from war. Right? Now, let me pause for just a second. This is pointing to who my grandma is. The rest of my family was not on board with this. But she called them all and was like, we need to love on Matt more than we've ever had. And I'm throwing a party for him. You know, his mom's bailing him out of jail. Most of my family's like, what the fuck for that dirtbag blah, blah. And grandma was like, well, then stay home. You know, but no one told grandma no. She had the power to get them all to show up and to put their own opinions aside and to stand there in love for me. It was just the power that this woman walked in, right? So when mom parked the car, well, guess what, guys? I didn't want to get out the fucking car. Hmm. And I'm just sitting there with my head down like, oh, this is awkward. And so my grandma left everyone on the porch, handed someone else the cake, and she stepped down off the porch and started walking out to me. And I saw her coming, so I got out. And we approached one another and guys, the way she looked at me, she looked at me like I was a man of such greatness. She looked at me with such respect and adoration as if I was the greatest man on the planet. And then the way she spoke to me, she was talking to me literally as an honorable man of greatness. You know, the ancient scripture says, call those things which be not as though they were. <clears throat> and that's what she was doing. She was not even f giving any power or attention to the false identity that I was walking in at the time, she showed up and looked at me and spoke to the real me, my true identity. That's who she was speaking to, to call forth the real me, not the foolish boy, false identity that I'd been acting and walking in. And guys, I almost believed it, meaning when you do enough wrong whatever wrong things get in trouble enough and people say oh you're bad after a while you start to believe it. i guess i am bad i guess i ain't shit i guess i'm always gonna be like 
a fool or whatever. And I took that on as my identity, mm-hmm. even on that car ride. It didn't change my heart. It just changed my mind. I got to do this smarter and better. Right. But I was living in a false identity and didn't even realize it until that God encounter with my grandma. And I could see in her eyes the possibility of what she was seeing in me. And in that moment, all my walls were shattered and it made me want to actually do something good so that this type of love would not be in vain. Like I didn't deserve this. I didn't deserve a fucking welcome party. I didn't deserve a cake and a welcome home sign. I didn't deserve my grandma coming out and looking at me and talking to me as the great. I mean, she talked to me like I could be president of the United States one day if I wanted to. Right. And it was such piercing truth that I could not hide. And my false identity started to melt. Um, and this is what I mean by unconditional love. Call those things which be not as though they were. She, even though I wasn't acting like a good man, that's what she was calling out of me. Even though I hadn't done anything good, she was talking to me as if I had. Call those things which be not as though they were. She was calling out my true identity, the best version of me. Will you please stand up? Simply by speaking to that man. <clears throat> My God, it does something inside of me broke. And guys, on that day, it's not like from that moment on, I was forever changed and was a good boy after that. No, but the seed that was planted in my heart on that day, you know, it was promised to her would not return void. You know what I'm saying? That was an unbreakable truth of love and seed that just went been inserted into my ecosystem to begin waking up my true identity on that one day folks this is why i call it unconditional love you know when we got people in our lives that do crazy shit do fucked up shit it's easy to (coughs) react to the way they're acting But to be able to look through all that past that and speak to someone's true identity, that's what can call forth the real you, right? And that's the gift she gave me. I I think it may be important, and I don't know if you plan on doing this, but letting our listeners know what it was you got caught for um, just because, like, you weren't stealing yo-yos at fucking Walmart, you know? Okay, okay. Because it just, well, one, it makes that your grandma even that much more of a powerhouse Mm -hmm. from what you uh, were caught doing. Mm. Um, And it may, I don't know, it just makes it more profound, you know? Okay. Because it's not like, oh, yeah, easy. Let's, it was probably the hardest thing for her to like do that, I would imagine. If I'm in her shoes, it was like, Mm -hmm. I would be running rackets like, what's the best way to handle this? And it's like, of course, it's love. But she's the only one. My whole family, my parents, that that approach was not an option. Right. Well, the most of the world wouldn't be. That's why the one who it was, and it happened to be my grandma, is the one that I believe God, source, the universe, used to fucking wake me up to the real me. Right? Um, but okay, again, you listeners, I don't know. Whenever I tell... Tell people this, they change their mind about me. <laughs> <laughs> so I can hear a lot of them being like, okay, that, that dude's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I thought he was a lame, but, but I nah, guess this now is, he's cool. I guess this is important. If people who know me today just think like, I don't know, that I've always been like whatever a certain way. Well, I haven't. We all have a past, right? Um Do you want me to just say what the crime was or do you want me to say why I even fucking got in that boat and even did the crime? Say what the crime is and then say why you got into it. Okay. In 1995. Well, now I'm fucking giving my age away. (laughs) (laughs) I was on the run for a little over a year. You know, 
it, back then, my mom's house was raided. My grandma's house was raided. Everyone's phones were tapped. Uh, I still got, I should pull out, I still got the newspaper clippings of asking the whole community to help bring me to justice. You know, there was rewards out, bounty hunters looking for me, like thinking someone's hiding me up in the city. And there's fucking detectives and SWAT teams scouring the city, raiding my mom's house. My pa- Look anywhere I could be staying, turning it upside down. Well, I wasn't in the city. I was fucking you know, on the run thinking that this is going to be my life because, and I had heard and I had asked back then, how long does a man have to be on the run before they just quit looking for you? Mm -hmm. And at the time they were like 15 to 20 years, you know, if not forever, but after 15 years, you know, you're not like the hottest on the radar. And I just remember thinking, well, I'm going to be running the next 15 years, but probably the rest of my life. Well, that got old and tiring but something happened to me when I was on the run and I had another God encounter. Um, and I felt called to go back home and just turn myself in. But I wasn't alone. I literally felt like it was me and God going. And I knew that I was probably going to go to prison for life. I was looking at 25 to life in prison. So if I don't do life... The minimum they're hitting me with 25 years. And I was going home to sign up for that willingly, thinking I'm going to have a prison ministry from the inside. (laughs) (laughs) And I was ready for it. And and you could have been a famous tattoo artist. (laughs) Man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know. Um, And this was one of the earlier times where I was learning to take responsibility. And this is when I had this God encounter. It was almost like, uh, yeah, you got to take responsibility. But okay, I'll pause that and just tell you what you want me to tell you. I was charged and on the run for 14 accounts of armed robbery. Is that mind blowing to you? Um, no. Okay. Because now, I, I will say... I had never arm okay. robbery of what banks, <laughs> pizza joints, <laughs> like you name it. We hit licks, boy. We <laughs> hit licks. You by yourself? No, thank you, Josh. So I had two accomplices, two partners. Both of their names were Jason. Uh, two of my tightest dudes, and this was something. And, and at the time, you remember the movie Point Break? Mm-hmm. One of my favorite movies. Mine too. At the time, I used to watch it daily, you know, and they'd put mask on as the presidents and they'd fucking swoop into a bank and take it over. And usually they'd pull off a heist and not hurt nobody. And, you know, I fantasized about that, you know, and that looked like a, again, back to being an adventure. That looked like an adventure. Mm -hmm. And I'm down to take that adventure under one condition that no one ever gets hurt. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I still wasn't going to just do that because I thought the movie was cool. But it, so what led to it is I was moving a bunch of weight on this particular trip. I had some other investors and these are guys you don't fuck around with to go on a bigger order. I got set up and robbed for it all. Not only did I lose my whole deal, but I lost all these other guys' money. But these guys' money is the type that if I don't get it, Within hours, they're going to break my legs or my family's legs. And so I was in a rock and a hard place. Like I knew I shouldn't have been fucking around with these dudes. And somehow maybe they're even the ones that caused the mm. setup and robbed me and then coming after me for Double up. their money. Yep. And I'm like, fuck. And it wasn't nothing. Be- and so out of that place of fear and desperation, I was like, God, I don't know how we're going to have to come up with some money like quick. And that's when Jason and Jason was like, we got to hit a lick. It's the only way. And I was like, no, nah, we can't, you know, I definitely don't want no one to get hurt. And guys, this is my fault. I, if we ever got in trouble, I wouldn't be able to live with myself. If you guys got in trouble, like, man, Clemmer, let's do this, right? Um, and with enough desperation, with all the right ingredients and their pressure, blah, 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 we decided to fucking give it a whirl, you know, um, and did. And guys, it was the probably one of the biggest adrenaline rushes of my life and after i did it and we're running away i'm running uh and throwing up at the same time and it was like the craziest the scariest and i do remember 
standing behind before the first one, I was standing behind. There was this line in the sand. It was like a line in the spirit realm. It's like one of those lines, moments in your life where you're about to make a decision and you know, things could like, can't go back from this point. Can't. There's no turning back from this point. And when I, and I stood out there, God knows how long, even like, Warring, internally warring, praying, like, is there another way? I don't have to do this, blah, blah, blah. And to be completely honest with you guys, oh, man, this is vulnerable. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I had such love for the cops are outside. For my, I know. <laughs> I had such love for my setup. dudes, Jason and Jason, that I didn't want to be responsible for their lives and I'm eating this. This is my fuck up. So if we're going to hit a lick, I'm going to do it by myself. And so the first one I did by myself. Yeah. And I stood behind that thing and there was a line in the sand. And I remember like I'm talking, the, the voices in my head were screaming and I, there was multiple ones. You know, the good angel uh, on one shoulder, the devil on the other. Well, they were there along with a lot of other fuckers, you know. When I finally decided and I crossed over and when I took the step, when I decided I'm doing this, I took a step right before I walked in, I felt like time stopped and it almost felt like darkness came over me for a minute. Now, it didn't seem like an evil, but it just felt dark. And I fucking went and did the deal. So you've been charged with all this, right? So it's. Yeah, I can't be incriminated. I, we'll get so to the story of how I'm actually alive and free and here today to even tell the story. What was the first place? Well, the first place again, and I'd never done this right. And this first place was a gas station. Which guy around here? Omega on fucking Hoke Road there in 49 by JVS. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's yeah. out there, dude. Yeah. But, you know, I lived, my farm was not, you know, I lived around there too, but. Nighttime? Fuck yeah. You know, um, and to make it even crazier. And again, I was just like, I think I was maybe 19 and this was a last minute deal. Anyway, so I went and did it by myself. And remember how I said, as long as no one got hurt. And the reason why is because, and no one did. But you know what I didn't think of? is how much harm and hurt it caused the person I robbed. Yeah, they didn't get shot. Yeah, they didn't get physically hurt, but fucking emotionally oh, yeah. wrecked mm -hmm. them. And that wasn't on my radar. You know what I'm saying? It was only later I had to like realize how much damaging that was to the person that got held up and how traumatic that was for them. Because they didn't know me. They didn't know my heart. They didn't know I was actually scared to death. And if that person would have said no, I'd have been like, okay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> how much did you owe the, do the, the investors? That's a good question. I think like 20, 20, 30 grand. What was your first lick? 850 some bucks. Oh shit. At this uh, little gas station register. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to need that to get high to fucking get and me the balls to I go mean, again. I had that in my hand <laughs> and was fucking running and throwing up to my getaway car. Right. Um, I don't know. I'll just withhold who was my getaway car. But, uh, <laughs> um, so, John, yeah, I Johnny went Utah. And I went to a hotel room and dumped the bag out on the bed. And we saw and it was only like 800 some bucks, whatever was in the drawer. Right. And so this was a dilemma because I actually crossed the line and did that thing. But the reason why I really did it, we didn't come close. And this is when Jason and Jason was like, man, we're going to have to hit a much bigger lick and mm -hmm. you're going to need our help. Then we decided to turn it into more of a professional deal instead of just a quick run you know what i'm saying that's when we you know decided to do bigger places anyways after we did it again i grew a major conscience one we got the money we needed we're good we're out of trouble so when with the next lick yeah. you got 20k yep so here's the deal we're done you know and let's thank god we made it through no one got hurt and we're at home watching ourselves on the news you know what i'm saying but we are so disguised, even the description, you know, um, wasn't us, you know. And so there, on one hand, even though it was scary as hell, on the other hand, we got away with it. And it was the biggest adrenaline rush of our lives. And so now it felt like 
we're actually living point break. We're like the real, we're living that, Mm -hmm. but we're good. But the adrenaline rush was so good. And Jason and Jason thought we were so good at it that we ain't stopping now. But I was like, yes, we are guys. Yes, that was fun. And we need to count our fucking lucky stars that we can sit here and talk shit about it. Let's not risk it all again. And now we don't have a need to. There's no need to. We're good. Let's just get back on and never speak of it again. Well, Jason and Jason decided they weren't done. They st- And I was the mastermind behind it all. And I was like the dad, like I am in most circles, making right. sure we on our P's and Q's. Right. So they decided, well, fuck uh, Clemmer, you may be out, but we're not done. So they decided to keep doing them without me for the fun of it, for the fuck of it. Well, dude, they'd go out and get all fucked up and just get real sloppy, sloppy and just be driving. It. It'd be type deal where they should be driving and they look over, hey, there's Casano's. Hey, let's hit it and just whip in and pull their hats down and run in and then run back out. They start hitting licks all over town, but was sloppy as fuck. They weren't disguised. <clears throat> Sometimes, you know, they weren't. They just got sloppy. <clears throat> and so they left their fingerprints, got themselves on camera. Now the investigators at least have two suspects. But they knew there was a ring of three. Well, it wasn't long, and they were able to find and apprehend both Jason and Jason and arrested them. They well, turned state evidence. Huh? Did they turn state evidence? Meaning like they told on you? Yes. Okay. But after one of them, because I got one of them was in interrogated for like 12 or 14 hours before he broke the other one, 16 hours before he broke. Like, I mean, I give them props. They tried to hold it, you know, but they both interrogation got broken, but they both lasted pretty long. Right. You know, but they're all, they knew who's your leader, who's behind this really. And probably fucked with them. Like, whoa. We'll cut your deal. You know what I'm saying? You could do 25 years or tell us who your leader is and only do three, whatever. They both broke and turned on me. But here's a big difference. They had hard evidence on them guys. They had them on camera, had their fingerprints. They had no evidence on me. Just these guys' testimonies, right? But that was enough for them to come looking for me. And that's when I hit the road and started running. And their search parties out for me everywhere, you know, and this lasted for a while. About I think I was on the run for 15 months before I decided to come home, you know, and turn myself in. You only had 14 more years to go. You know, <laughs> um, well, the fact that I'm not in prison today and sitting here and I've gotten not just a second chance of life, but. 1,000 chances. Right. Now, again, guys, for reference, I think I was 19 at the time. Today, sitting here, I'm 46. Just to let you know, this didn't happen last week. But it's a part of my story. So I'm not ashamed of anything of my story. It's part of my story. We all fall down. We just get back up. But I also am not quick to share these details with most people because most people can't handle it without judging me. You right? was so hesitant to tell me that shit when I first started working with you. And I just like kept poking. I need to know. Dude, I don't tell, tell nobody this. Now you got me telling the whole fucking <laughs> podcast. <laughs> well, tell people in Japan. <laughs> because there's somebody out there that's fucking probably went through some similar shit and they just can't shake that guilt and shame off. And in recovery, yeah. we say that... W- we learn that our experience is no longer the guilt and shame that we have to lug around with us, but instead a treasure chest of great experiences to help guide and um, inform people that may be going down a similar road. So it's like, come on, brother. That's uh, that that's that's the hit because there's nothing to be ashamed of if you've changed your ways, mm-hmm. you know, and repented for it. Yeah. Um, and I've used that. It is a treasure chest because it. I believe has been added to my superpowers to actually help heal the world and help other people. And without having gone through some of the shit I've gone through. And when you see like a fucking dick bag, like you're not so quick to just fucking condemn them and fucking 
cut their throat. Like you're like, wait a minute. They just might be going through a rough patch. That's right. And they're walking in their false identity right now. And I can see through that and see their true identity and speak to that and call that forth just like my grandmama did for me. And I do that for everyone. Mm -hmm. That's one reason why you've witnessed it's been hard for me to fire folks when we know they need to go because I'll see the good in them. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> and because it was extended, that mercy was extended to me most of my life. So I've been given it. I've got a lot of it to give grace and mercy. And I've fucking, I don't know anyone that's used up more grace than I have, hmm. except for maybe you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, fuck. So anyways, guys, it's a miracle that I'm here. Why? Because look, I'm looking at 25 to life. And they're charging me with 14 accounts of armed robbery. Now, as I told you, I didn't do all them. I was just part of two. Jason and Jason did the others. They're charged putting all of them on me. You know, like I'm the mastermind. Even though I didn't do some of them, I was the ringleader and sent them to do it. I'm getting hit with all of them. And it, the, it, the charges were 25 to life in prison. Well... <clears throat> my d- and I decided to come back in town, but I wanted to do it right and get an attorney. I went and got my father's attorney, who was like one of the best in Dayton. And I called him and snuck into his office. And he told me, Matt, can you get here without being apprehended? I want to be able to bring you in. We cannot let the cops get you and take you in because he didn't even want me to get fucking apprehended and broken in interrogation. He wanted me to safely get to him and we go in together and he can protect me out the gate and not get interrogated without him. All that shit, right? But they were looking for me everywhere. <clears throat> Phones were tapped. I had to even be careful who I called. But anyways, I snuck into his office. Well, guys, here's where we thought the miracle was. Because remember, I'm now rolling with God. So I'm doing this and I feel like I can't lose. I really feel like I'm covered. And I'm sitting in front of my attorney. It's me and my mom and my attorney. His name's Bobby Joe Cox. He used to smoke big old fat cigars. And he was just classy up on like the top floor, whatever, on second or third street, you know. Anyways, <clears throat> looking at 25 to life. But he goes over all the evidence. And he's like, man, we're going to go in. <clears throat> and you just enter a not guilty plea. I'll take it from there. They've got hard evidence on Jason and Jason. Their fingerprints, their video. They have no hard evidence, just their testimonies. That's called hearsay. Hearsay does not hold up in a court of law. All you got to do is say two words, not guilty, and I will win this thing. I'll probably just get it thrown out. Is there anywhere you can hide tonight? We'll go in tomorrow and turn you in and start this process tomorrow. But you just got to not get caught tonight. Is there anywhere you could go? And my mom was like, I got somewhere we can go. And mom knew a friend that lived way out in the boonies outside of Greenville. That mom, because her phones were tapped, she wasn't even calling this friend. Well, who was this friend? I'll just tell you guys this. <clears throat> she was like a spiritual guru, a prophetess. Some may say a psychic, an empath on 10, right? <clears throat> The craziest thing, guys. So there was no warning, no call to her. Can we come over? Nothing. Me and mom get in the car and sneak out, go down country roads, and we're just going to stake out and hide at this prophetess's house. Right? Craziest. And guess what? My mom is celebrating like, oh, thank you, God. Like, Matt's going to get off of all this. The attorney just told us. I just go in tomorrow, plead not guilty. He's going to get me off of this, maybe even thrown out of court. I'm getting such grace and mercy on my life. A second chance. Happy day. My mom is stoked. I mean, she's singing and crying that this is all going to work out. And then we get to this woman's house. And right when we get up on her porch, it's like the movies. Go to knock on the door. And before I do, the door opens. And she opens and looks at me and says, there you are. I've been expecting you. Hmm. And me and mom look at each other. Man, what time is it? 12.14 a.m. Matt, I don't know about you, but I like coffee. You know I do, every day, all day. Man, and I could go for one right now. So our Mm. listeners, did you know that you can buy us a coffee? For real? Yeah. 
All they Why gotta, would they do that? Well, if you like what we do and you support our show and you appreciate our content, you can just go and click that little button that our producer Mike puts in every show and buy us a coffee just to show your contribution that you appreciate what we do for you to Are help you us real? out. I'm People t- can really buy us a coffee. Totally. I would be honored if you bought me a coffee. And not only that, but we got a little spot. It's special for uh, the VIP listeners. It's called Close Friends on Instagram. And on there, you can see some behind-the-scenes content. And when the cameras ain't running, seeing all the shit, we'd be talking about each other. (laughs) Is that true, Mike? Damn, you guys. This is the first I've heard about either of these. So they can buy you or me a coffee. Or Mr. Carlton. Or Mr. Carlton. And, like get a sneak peek behind the scenes yeah by doing what again fucking smashing that button (laughs) (laughs) okay (laughs) what button you talking about i want to smash the button it's the fucking the button on the fucking thing (laughs) okay (laughs) (laughs) do it just do it (laughs) absolutely demolish the button But thanks for your time again, and we appreciate all our listeners. Always.